Good afternoon, viewers. Welcome back to another episode of the Free Marketeers podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today on the 8th of May. I hope you're all doing well in lockdown, not going stir crazy yet. I am having longer conversations with my dogs, but that started before the lockdown. So I'm not too worried about losing my sanity there. Uh, viewers, I have a very, very special guest today for you. Uh, someone who I've looked up to for a very long time, who I'm very happy to have, uh, to have his time and his expertise. We've got Pavlo Fatidis on here. Pavlo, thank you so much for being with me today. That's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, Pavlo, I, I was listening to you yesterday on 702. Uh, you'd mentioned, uh, you know, some of your views on small business and the impact of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. And you, you talked about the UK and how unemployment there has gone up to 15% from 4%. You mentioned it's the worst recession since 1706. I mean, in South Africa, we had the FM if we talk about how we've got more than 10 million unemployed people. And I'm sure it's even more than that now with the lockdown, with the epidemic and all that stuff. So the impact on on people's livelihoods and especially on small businesses is massive, I think, uh, massively devastating. So I'm very glad we can have you on here where you can give us your take on the impact of the epidemic and maybe looking forward, we'll get to that later in the episode, uh, what businesses, what small businesses can do and also what corporate South Africa can do along with uh, what govern po government policies could maybe be implemented. So we'll start there with the first uh, aspect, uh, just your take on COVID-19, the effect it's having on the, on the small business climate in South Africa. Uh, maybe you can give us your overview there. So I think, um, you know, Christo, whenever you give a view on the environment, you have to take a view on the environment. And I'm going to speak very much as an entrepreneur, as someone who invests in businesses, who's built businesses. Um, and I'm going to share a view that's been to a degree managed and formulated from not only South Africa, but the US and the UK where I work as well. And the view is nobody knows. I listen to some of the top epidemiologists speak and then contradict each other, not out of ego, but through genuine scientific misunderstanding of what the virus actually is and what it means. So given that, the strategy that I'm certainly seeing roll out from a South African point of view is we decided to look after lives first. We took a very conservative approach uh, because of the nature of our population and because of the leadership we have around preserving lives and looking after lives. And the long and the short of it is that is governed and determined by the capacity of our healthcare services. So the COVID view that we've adopted is going to be made up of, as we well know, a series of complete lockdowns to opening the economy. And I foresee over the next 18 months, before we have access to a global vaccine, that opening and closing of the economy wax and wane, much like the moon might rise and fall. Mm -hmm. So there's no certainty about being in one stage, moving to the next stage and remaining in that stage. It will be governed entirely by our healthcare capacity and by the virus having a vaccine altogether. Within that context, there is only one strategy that any business owner should have. And that is you need to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Because anything that improves on what you've prepared for will translate into commercial success for yourself. The second thing is you need to get yourself into a place where you can lead your way through this COVID economy. And that means lead your team through the COVID economy. And through yourself and your team, you then need to lead your customers and your suppliers through the COVID economy so you can emerge as one of the few businesses standing six months, eight months, 10 months, 12 months from now. That part of leading, really what we can revert to, there was a wonderful woman, Krista, wonderful woman, um, and I think she passed on about four years ago. Uh, she's an American Swiss psychologist who committed her life to studying grief. What happens to someone when they lose someone they love? And her name was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And what she did is she drew up the Kubler-Ross change curve, the grief change curve. She argues that the first experience is one of denial when the shock finally arises that you might be losing someone you love. You then go through a period of frustration, which manifests in a combination of anger and fear. 
and then you hit a well of depression when you lose that person. The way out of that depression, she argued, is that you need to start physically taking control of your actions and your life to find a new path in order to find a new way of living without that person and in the process, get control of yourself, get control of your life and get control of the meaning that you're going to create going forward. If we all sit back for a minute and think about that denial, shock and frustration, depression, moving into action, integrating what works into our lives and finding meaning again. It's a very good starting point for any business owner who is at absolute fear that they're about to lose everything they have to get themselves into a positive place of action and then also to use that understanding to talk to their staff, understand where their staff are at, and then to translate that to their customers and suppliers too. Because behind every customer and every supplier, there's a human being who has a whole lot of trouble, whether it be at home or whether it be with their employment in the COVID economy. The starting point for everybody is that kind of empathy and insight. Because should you get to that place and should you understand it like that, you find control over yourself, you get into a positive frame of mind around acting, and acting is the most critical thing that any small business can do right now. I think it's interesting that many people are talking about the fourth industrial revolution and the impact of technology and all that, but I very much want to highlight what you said there, and I think, and I hope that whether it's a small business, an individual uh, entrepreneur, a big corporate, multinational conglomerate, or whether it's a government, I'm hoping that we see a big rise in emotional intelligence, in emotional um, awareness, in empathy for each other. I think that will be absolutely crucial and that might differentiate some businesses from others. It might uh, set them apart. Uh, nowadays, you're not gonna, just going to convince customers by telling them your, I don't know, your profit margin for the last quarter. You're going to convince them by showing how you treat each other, how you treat your employees, how you treat customers. That's exactly right. It's crucial for two reasons. Um, and both of them are for survival. So see it as a necessity. Don't see it as a, an option. Mm. It is a necessity. That empathy will allow you to lead your team more effectively. And then you want to do as a small business or medium-sized business has been a situation where you can't trade for various reasons, either because you are in the high risk, medium risk or low risk economy, or because of circumstances leading up to the COVID economy itself. A lot of businesses weren't able to build proper reserves, for example. Mm -hmm. So all of that creates the pressure, it all creates the economic shock. It drops you into that place of depression. And it's a funny thing, you see, if you remain depressed or you remain positive in action, the way you will see the same signal will be fundamentally different. A person who is stuck in the well of depression We'll look at that signal and not see the opportunity in it. A person who's inspired to act and is acting and therefore empowered to change the circumstances they find themselves in will see that same signal and see the opportunity in it. Now, you've got to get yourself there in order to get your staff there. Mm -hmm. And your staff and yourself then have to get your customers there. Because what led to your success leading up to the COVID instance will be fundamentally different what leads to not only your survival but your success thereafter and the success thereafter is divided into three stages the way I see it the first is you have to save what you have I call that resetting after that you then have to rebuild on the new reset that reset making you relevant to the new environment you're trading in and that rebuilding is crucial because in rebuilding a business on a technical level, that's how you institute change permanently. And the reason you want to do that is because if you've rebuilt the business correctly, it takes you away from the front battle line where you need to be in the red or reset period in order to take a step back six months from now and start looking beyond where you are for the opportunities to acquire failed competitors or to acquire um, for 30 cents in the, the rand, the stock of competitors to acquire customers that haven't been properly attended to because those competitors have not changed the way and manner of how they are working in the economy itself. 
So you've got the reset period, you've got the rebuild period, and then it lines you up for the reignite period. When people have said to me, Krista, but how can you think growth in this economy? Growth is a very interesting question because growth doesn't mean putting your foot down. Growth means doing the readjustment to remain relevant. Growth means doing the rebuild of your business model, a large part of which should be adopting the elements, at least, of technology, digitization, and mechanization, because it's simply impossible to trade without that. And that often requires drawing back, perhaps cutting back in the business, consolidating it on a new footing with the view to then grow. If you don't have that growth mindset in the economy today, which is dead, the likelihood of you having it when the rest of the economy is growing means by definition, those who had it at this point in time will be so far ahead of you. I think it's unlikely you'll catch up to them. It, it, it is one of the most difficult and interesting times I think many small business owners find themselves in. But if one can manage to have that growth mindset now, I think you can set yourself up very well for the, for the coming years. Uh, Pavlo, next, I'd like to just expand our view a little bit to include corporates in South Africa. Um, I read that uh, South Africa's 550,000 small businesses employ an estimated 6 million people. Of course, this was before the lockdown. So, I mean, small businesses play a massive part in the economy. And I, uh, I hope that people realize that if they don't, maybe if they didn't before the, the pandemic, they do now. Um, we see every day the headlines and how many small businesses are closing down and they might not survive um, for the next month, never mind the next six months. What do you think of the relationship between small businesses and, and corporates, corporate South Africa? I know that's the sort of big entity. Maybe we should refer to corporates as individual entities, not as corporate South Africa, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on that sort of relationship. Maybe some would call it a symbiotic relationship. Yeah. You know, it's a very content, it's a very contentious relationship mm -hmm. because, um, there's a love hate relationship between corporates and small medium enterprises. So the first thing I'd like to say is, you know, the SME, the term SME is a disservice to everyone in corporate for the simple reason that there's no proper definition behind it. When I speak to a lot of corporates, I, I work with um, about 64 corporates in South Africa and about another 25 odd between the US and the UK. And the tendency for corporates to look at businesses that hit, let's say, revenues of up to about 300 million rand a year as SMEs misleads their opportunity and misinterprets what the economy really is in terms of how it functions. Firstly, we've got the formal and informal markets and the two are distinctly different from each other. In the formal market, you have a lot of registered businesses that have taxable incomes of zero. So that means it's simply registered businesses that aren't trading or businesses that are so survivalistic. They're the ones that haven't lasted the month. You then have the micro enterprises and however you choose to define it, I choose to take it up to around 10 million rand a year. Those businesses are fledgling. Their ability to do things, their ability to uh, shape things very differently in a significant meaningful way for a corporate is low. You then have from around 15 odd million up to, and let's move it very quickly up to the 300 million mark. What's interesting about those businesses, and this is how as a corporate, I would be looking at them, is in the last five years of our economy, which has grown at around an average 1.2, 1.7%, certainly within that mid-tier range, um, and I'm speaking across the client base now of about 550 clients in South Africa, the, the annual average revenue growth rates there have set a 29.8% on a compound basis. So if we look at that as the growth rate, within the context of the country's growth rate, within the context of the JSC's performance, that mid-tier, the earliest stage of which is around 50 million a year, to the later stage which sits at around 300 million a year, that's where the growth has really taken place pre-COVID. And it tells us why that's where we will see the opportunities post-COVID. That segment, Christo, is made up of around 40,000 formalized businesses in South Africa. 
I think it's 39,021 more or less. And those stats, uh, I took the uh, taxable income rates and the VAT rates, and I correlated them together. It's an approximation. Mm -hmm. Those businesses, all competing in narrow areas, but 40,000 competitors put those business owners in a very interesting disposition. And it works like this. I'm competing with many, many, many players. I'm constantly competing for my existence. As I get out competed, out of necessity, I need to do things differently. And that's the definition of innovation. I then innovate, I get traction in the market with my new innovation, and immediately what that does is it attracts funding. The funding and the innovation together attract more talent, and more talent in that sector creates more competition, which leads more innovation to attract more talent and more funding, and it creates a virtuous cycle. As a corporate, what has my experience been like for the last five years? Certainly most of the corporate clients I've worked with have reset strategy year after year after year for the last five years. Because the promises made by government and the economy, the forecast put forward by economists in the economy have not manifested. So big entities have to restructure in order to uh, reduce risk. And every time you restructure, by the time you bring your new strategy to the ground, it's the end of the next financial year and you start again. Surely then, I would as a corporate be looking at those SMEs saying, my future innovation and my future growth will come from those that are winning within that SME economy. The second thing and the last point I want to make from a corporate perspective is because SMEs by definition are smaller than very big large entities, and because the vested interest of that SME surviving is close to the cold face. In other words, take the CEO of one of the biggest businesses in South Africa, look at the customers they serve, and look at the many, 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 many layers between the customer and the CEO. When you look at that mid-market segment, that mid-market segment is far closer from an ownership point of view and therefore vested interest point of view to that customer and what the requirements of that customer are or is, and therefore have the ability to respond and innovate. When you invest in that capability, it means that that mid-market sector will be the first to see the changes that will work in this COVID economy, as opposed to competitors in the corporate space. So from a corporate perspective, I'm looking there for my growth, I'm looking there for my innovation, and I'm looking there to get ahead. I'm definitely getting a sense of, of being nimble there, whether no matter the size of, of the business, uh, it, there needs to be a sense of, of nimbleness, of uh, thinking on your feet, of adapting, of being ready for these changes. And I'm hoping that many businesses can do that going forward. Uh, I'll jump now to an even bigger perspective. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about government and government policies. What do you think governments can or, or can't, maybe should or shouldn't do going forward for a post-COVID you know, South Africa, do you think that there's a different way of looking at that sort of, you know, action, interaction, that sort of role? Obviously, at the IFMF, we love to talk about the, we love to point to the barriers to employment and that sort of thing. But I thought it would be great to get your perspective on, on that relationship again with government and businesses. What, what different way there can be to approach this sort of uh, relationship? So, Krista, you know what? I, I think we have, we have a government that's generally not friendly towards business. Mm. And we have a government that doesn't have a clear economic strategy. The one thing that has really frustrated me for a long time is I live in a world of remarkable people. So my lived reality in working with business owners and in working with the corporates that I work with, I work with people who are smart, who are hardworking, who are very driven. And the frustration I have is we have, as a new dispensation, inherited an economy that has been built on an extractive mindset. It's one that's lazy. 
in that it has been built and blessed with remarkable resources and as a result of those two factors has never developed a sufficient vibrancy to spur on competition. And yet I see the competition taking place within the sector I work in. And within that sector that I predominantly work in, I see many opportunities for us to play a role in the global value chain. And that's my biggest frustration with government. We have not clearly articulated how we as a country want to create an economy that would be relevant to the global economy by slicing and dicing a few niches where we can, using what we have, become the best in the world, number one. The second reason we can't do that is because we have a government that has four economic ideologies constantly battling each other. We have the relative practical opportunism and good sense of reality that we find in our finance minister, Tito Mboweni. We have a president who's very aligned with big business, corporate thinking. We have uh, the Esma Gashulas of the world who seem to be tied to the former administration's ideologies around what the economy's purpose is. And then we have an ideology that we find largely with um, our minister in the DTI and uh, Minister Pravin Gordon, which have a socialist communist leaning around central command and central control. And until we have one direction from our government in power around one ideology as to how the economy ought to be built, it creates constant ongoing uncertainty within the context of business. Business needs certainty, not good news. Business needs certainty, not easy access to opportunity and business itself. There are many barriers in all the economies I work with where people constantly turn on and say government gets in the way of business and government does get in the way of business. It would be great if our government got in the way of our business over here, but with one position alone, so that as business, we can cater to that position and create the opportunity and growth within the context of that position. But the number of times I've worked with businesses, both medium, big, corporate, and small, where we have set a path and a new minister arrives or a new position arrives in legislation, or legislation is spoken about but never implemented. And when it is implemented, it's never policed efficiently. And for that, I look at the environment, for that, I look at the uh, power and electricity generation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It leaves me feeling beyond frustrated because the raw inherent talent, mostly of our people, can never then be manifested. And the reason I say our people is because I look at what the response was in the US. I look at what the response was in the UK around shutdown. And all of a sudden, the approaches that we share with our clients here became very actively adopted in those environments. And when I look at the reason why, Christo, as South Africans, we have a natural ability to work with uncertainty thanks to the performance of government. It's given us an inherent fitness per se but there is a line that needs to be drawn. My big concern at the moment is the incredible policy that was put forward by our health ministry, which was, if you listen carefully to the presentation, it was fair and equitable. Whether you be black, whether you be white, whether you be rich, whether you be poor, whether you be male or female, old or young, everyone is at the, risk, at the same level of risk. Everyone is at the same level of risk. And yet I look at the response economically and we're sitting in a profoundly unfair position where it's largely the SME economy that has to suck it up. Because in many instances, the banks are able to operate, the insurance companies are operating, the very big healthcare providers are operating. It's mostly the SMEs and I think, especially the retail environment that is put in a position where they've got to suck it up. And the unfairness, the, 
the inequity of the economic strategy is going to be what unravels the health strategy. I've been arguing this for some time and I've been arguing for a different kind of intervention. And if that different intervention doesn't appear, I think we're going to be in for a fairly rough COVID ride in the next six to eight months. There you have it, viewers, and to you, government, as well. Get the, get your shop sorted out now, otherwise the SME sector is going to be hobbled for, I would say, decades to come. Uh, Pavlo, we'll wrap up our conversation there, but I did want to give you the opportunity to please talk a little bit about your recent book, uh, Sweat Scale Cell. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have a copy of that. I've read it a few times. I think it's invaluable. Um, I wouldn't want to make as little of it as it's a blueprint to success or anything like that. Um, I think it's much more complex than that. It, uh, it uh, brings forth a lot more about the complexity of trying to run a business. But if you could just touch a little bit on, on your book. So um, I, I wrote the book, uh, Suffering from Very, Very Severe Jet Lag, about a year ago, uh, stuck in a hotel in New York, 3 a.m. in the morning. I started writing the book, and when I eventually woke up, and finished the 75,000 word sentence. Um, it was one single sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, I hid it away, I was too embarrassed to actually share it with anyone. <laughs> then a publisher got hold of me and wrangled it out of me and put me to work to shape it. And in effect, Christo, it's a book around how you remove all the myths and all the sexy language of business. Mm -hmm. The word pivot, the word next level, Growth, what does growth truly, truly mean? Value, how do you craft value into the design of a business to ensure that you can create scale? What is scale? It's a book on how to technically build a business in a very organized approach. And it's a book based on 11 stories of 11 South African entrepreneurs who built some remarkable businesses. And all of them did it under very testing, trying times. And it's also a book, finally, on how you get your mindset right to withstand what lies ahead. There is, incidentally, a COVID version because it was recently released on uh, Audible. Um, so there's a listening version and there's a digital version, obviously, through a Kindle or any other such reading device. Well, viewers, I would very much encourage you to get a hard copy of the book. The bookstores are open for now. Uh, we don't have those arbitrary government regulations yet, so bookstores are open. So you have no excuse not to get a hard copy of the book. If not, then get it on Audible, as Pavlo has mentioned. Uh, Pavlo, I will uh, wrap up on that note. I want to thank you so, so much for your time, viewers. I hope you you enjoyed this episode. Uh, viewers, and to you, as Pavlo mentioned about value and defining value, um, that subject, if you gain value from the work we do at the FMF, our articles, our media releases, our reports, please do support us. We depend on donations and support from you, the public, to continue doing the work we do, to continue investigating government policies and the effect they have on the economy. So please, and please try and support us, uh, especially in these difficult times. Please like the video, please share it uh, all over your different social media platforms and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, for, the, for, for the time being, um, maybe until next week, I'm hoping we can have another episode. Until then, everyone, please stay safe, stay healthy, look after yourselves, look after your families and look after the businesses around you. Let's uh, buy vouchers, that sort of thing uh, that we can use after the lockdown. Let's see how we can pull through uh, through this difficult time and uh, look forward to a post-COVID South Africa. But for now, I will say goodbye. Uh, see you soon.